My name's Alex Stone and I'm a cinematographer based here in the UK. I'm a bit of a lens geek, as many of us uh, filmmaker types are, and so I decided to make a series of videos on legendary lenses, both from the past and present, and discuss what makes them so special or unique, uh, what's given them that sort of cult-like uh, status. And uh, I figure there's no better lens to start with than one of the all-time classics, the Helios 44-2. I'm joined today by a special guest. Uh, he's way more of an expert than I am in this iconic lens. Um, you probably already follow his YouTube channel or his Instagram account or his Facebook page. And I suppose if you haven't heard of vintage lenses for video, then are you really even a lens geek? Um, Alan, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for the invitation, it's a pleasure. <laughs> so um, yeah, I wanted to, to bring you on because I mean, you're the internet's expert on vintage lenses. It's kind of in the name. So, well, well I guess, first of all, tell, tell people, how did, how did vintage lenses for video come about? Uh, funny enough, uh, the subject of the lens today is one of the first lenses that I ever acquired, the vintage ones, anyway. I used to be into photography and uh, using all sorts of modern Canon glass. And then by an accident, almost by an accident, I've picked up um, a Helios 44-2 and one more lens um, at a car boot sale. Those in UK know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> it's a garage sale in the US, I guess. Um, and I, I fell in love with it. Uh, the build quality, uh, the images, and the price. I picked it up for like five pounds. And I was like, this is amazing. You know, this, it's just such interesting images. It's, it's all metal. The Fox ring is nice and smooth. And, and you know, I can have it for so little. And I started looking into other options and I just discovered this world of amazing vintage glass. Did you know what it was before you bought it? No, actually, actually, you know, um, there are tons and tons of people out there who used to use vintage glass as their modern glass back in the day. For me, discovering vintage glass was, um, wasn't the same as it, it is for a lot of people who used to use, you know, back in the 80s or 70s, you know, when they were younger, because I'm not that old, <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Not that, not that I'm trying to say someone else is very old, but I'm not that old to um, know this glass natively, if you know what I mean. Like, I wasn't, I wasn't really, uh, living in that age when these lenses were around. Well, if you were, you so were pretty good for your age. I mean, they came out, what, 50s? That <laughs> 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 make you like 70 by now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they, they, they were making them or up until maybe 80s or something like that. Even until I got into video, I had no interest in manual lenses anyway because I was happy with uh, Canon EF glass. It's only when I got into the video side, filmmaking, all that stuff, it's when I started using my Canon F lenses uh, in a manual mode, and they were quite poor in that sense. Uh, if you're familiar with Canon F glass, it's the focus ring spins. Yeah, there's no hard uh, you know, stops, it's a really short focus. Keeps spinning, right. there are no hard stops. The, the, the motion itself, um, it's not particularly smooth. Uh, it's just not a very pleasant experience. And uh, in, you know, in the days of 5D Mark II, even if you wanted out of focus in the video, you couldn't have it. So you were using that EF glass with electronics, with everything, and not getting the best out of it. So when I picked up a fully manual lens, I was, I was like, this is perfect for what I'm doing because I'm using my Canon EF glass manually anyway. And, you know, it just, it just, it just went from there uh, I started discovering all these lenses, got addicted. Uh, before I knew it, I had like 250 lenses. <laughs> um, 
probably about 10, at least 10 of them were the Helios 44 twos, because, you know, I always say you can never have too many Helios 44 twos. <laughs> there are lots of variations, they're very cheap, and, um, you know, even you can even have more than one so you can gift it to someone, because it's such a cool lens to discover. Yeah, it kind uh, of is even like... Even if you don't need to. It's like the ultimate vintage lens, isn't it? It's a gateway drug. That's what this is. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, if if this wasn't one of the first vintage lens I discovered, there is a big chance uh, I would have never got into the whole thing. It's only it's only this very cheap, very simple, very easy to understand lens, lens when it came to my life. That's when, you know, it was, it was easy enough for me to try and, uh, you know, use one of these lenses. And, and, you know, there is a reason, you probably know, there is a reason why Helios 44.2 is such a good lens. Because it's, it has originated from uh, a Zeiss Yena Biota 58mm. I actually have one here um, in my collection. It's in exact amount. This is not the pre-war one. This is, um, this one I think was made in 50s. Uh, but this is what uh, the Helios lens came from. So when people say, you know, it's a miracle that, you know, Helios is, a, is actually a nice lens optically, it's, it's not a miracle. Um, and the only reason why it's so cheap, it's because they were made in millions, was one of the most mass-produced lenses out there. Um, I think that's the only reason why it's so cheap, because it, it, it does deserve to maybe a slightly higher price point, um, but they are availabilities is huge so it always drives the price down um, because this um, Zeiss version just only just optically they're almost identical I've, I've tested them against each other and you, there's there's barely any difference to them there's slightly like different coating and you know you might see those variations very subtle ones but uh, overall you know the character and everything else is is pretty much the same and this lens will cost you you know two to four times more than the Helios version. Uh, just because, you know, it's original, it's it's kind of rare. It's not very rare, but, you know, it's it wasn't as mass produced as Helios and also the brand name. So I would say, you know, Helios could easily be worth twice as much if, if, there, were, if there weren't that many of them. The good thing about uh, this Soviet lenses is that they have this very simple M42 screw mount. So the adapters for them are very simple to make and again very cheap. So for someone who's unsure about, um, you know, trying such lens, like me back in the day, maybe if the adapter was, you know, 30 pounds or something like that, I would have given up the idea. But you could pick up the adapter for under five dollars, you know, if you, if you bought from China. That's probably what I did. I mean, this this was probably cost about three quid. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean it works. It you know it screws on on the back. It's not of the ideal, lens. yeah. Uh, and then that that will mount onto a regular Canon EF mount. Um, I mean there are definitely better versions out there. Um, I mean I think the biggest problem, as as you know, with M42 is it's very easy to unscrew the lens off the adapter. You know if you're trying to change the aperture, it's just so easy to to unscrew the lens. There's some adapters that that have got little locking screws that will lock it tight. I've seen like PL adapter yeah. kits and all sorts. Um, yeah, I have one here. Another another great reason why this lens is so popular is it's one of the very few lenses that you can simply screw on a PL adapter on to without any modifications. Most of the other M42 lenses, you have to machine them down and, and things like that. And with this lens, if you want to use it on a very serious camera, just for fun, if you know, if that's, if that's the purpose of it, you can just buy one of these adapters and put a PL mount in it and you know it's it's so cheap and so easy it's just so versatile using it i've i've used this on uh, proper shoots even with this <laughs> this crappy 2 2 dollar uh, adapter um, just cuz the images are so great but from a functional point of view it's not ideal to use on you know a proper production is it um, yeah. i mean it's got a nice long focus throw which is which yeah, is great. Very long. Um, I yeah. think it's just such a short lens, so you're right up against the the, the yeah. camera. And if you put a, a lens gear on it, you know, often focus motors won't reach things like that. Yeah, that's exactly what I have here. It's um, 
if you imagine sticking that on on a PL mount, um, it very clears the the ring of the PL mount, the locking ring, and then the the actual gear is right up against yeah. that PL mount. Yeah. And like you said, a full focus of focus motor will really struggle, you know, to to fit in there. So it's far from ideal. It's just too small, you know, and um, and there's not much you can do about it in its original form. You know, this this is as far as you can take it. Yeah. You can obviously add, you know, like a front, like an 18 millimeter front to it and stuff like that. But this is more or less, you know, the the maximum that you can do in a in a modified form. One of the things I, I really like actually about the 44.2, um, which is great for video use, is the preset aperture ring. Um, you've essentially got two aperture rings. One is the aperture setting ring and one is the aperture ring. There's only one aperture, um, but they both control it in some way. In a photography lens, you would compose the image uh, with the lens wide open, so you get the maximum light through the viewfinder. And then at the, and most lenses have got a little, little uh, lever on the back of the lens, or modern lenses, they're all electronic, so it's, it's done electronically. Um, the moment you hit the shutter, the lens will stop down to the desired, you know, the selected aperture. But this is before that was even invented, so it's just used as a preset aperture. So the idea is you set your aperture on the top, so let's say I want it to be f8, and then you would set the, the bottom ring to f8 and you can compose wide open. And then just before you take your picture, you just close that ring down and it stops down to your aperture. But by setting your preset ring to f16, you've then essentially just got a declicked aperture from wide open all the way to 16. And I think that's one of the, the things I like about it for for video use, one of the things that attracted me is I can do iris pulls. Yeah, it just felt to me like this m mini Cine Prime. Yeah. You know, in a way. It just had, you know, the, the longest focus throw, hard stops, all metal, uh, declicked aperture. You know, you could put a PL mount on it, you could put a gear on it, front, and you could, and it's already like a mini Cine Prime for next to nothing. Uh, but th there is a there is a downside to that preset aperture is that a lot of people do not know about the second ring, so they they always ask me why is the aperture backwards? Because when you know when the ring when you spin the ring to f16 the lens is wide open, and then when you spin it back to two that's when it closes to f16. Yeah, and they all, they always tell me why is it why is it backwards? Or or it's and very it, easy to to have the. The preset ring like on I don't know two two eight or, or four and then yeah. it, it doesn't close down all the way yeah and doesn't close down so, so um, th the only other limitation I see in the preset aperture for video if if you are gonna allow it to be um, at f16 and have full rotation it can be a little bit difficult to to figure out which f-stop you are on yeah, that's true. You know, if you're just running, running like that. So you can, you can kind of try and guess that, you know, if it's, if it's X, if it's F11, maybe it's at 2.8 or something like that. You can try to guess that, but stops the other it's way, not yeah. very, yeah, and it's, it might not be very accurate way as well. So, uh, that, that's limitation. Again, for serious production, that can be a problem. Unfortunately, um, uh, even though Helios 44.2 is my favorite lens out of them all, I've only used it on one low budget shoot ever. Wow. Uh, pr prior to um, making the Rehausen, which we'll, we'll get to uh, well, let's, shortly. Let's, let's talk about that. So there's a company in Ukraine called Iron Glass who um, started doing cine mods, I suppose, on the Helios, yeah. They're, yeah. yeah, they're installing. Yeah, that's actually their cine mod. This one, it's not a, it's not a full cine mod, but it's something that they, they sent me to test out the decoded um, front and back elements. So they just quickly slapped one together, and they still put a PL and, and a ring on it. But um, yeah, that's that's that company that makes uh, like semi-permanent modifications 
to, to these lenses. So how did you get involved with Iron Glass? Because I know you've been working with them to develop not just uh, a cine modded version, but a completely rehoused version of the Helios, along with a lot of other Soviet primes, so that now that they are truly usable in a uh, you know, proper production environment. Tell us about that. So it all started from me wanting to make my Soviet set more usable. Like I said, um, I wasn't really taking it out on any jobs. It was always on my cardboard, uh, you know, I looked at it, I loved it, I never used it. And we started talking about, you know, all the all sorts of improvements that can be done. But, you know, when we started, it was very like formal. Uh, and obviously I was just like any, anyone else. Uh, and, and suddenly at some point uh, after we kept talking about what could be improved and the problems and things like that, um, I think we, we came to the conclusion that the only way to improve certain things on these lenses would be to rehouse them. Uh, and it was just a crazy idea. It was just, it was just like, you know, yeah, you know, it would be cool to rehouse them, but obviously that's not going to happen. You know, who, who would do that? And you guys, I'm not sure even if you guys can do that because they have never done anything as complicated. They, they were machining ni very nice focus gears uh, and all sorts of mounts and adapters. So they were machining quite uh, complicated parts already, quite precise parts, but nothing as, as complicated as, as a rehousing. Uh, but this idea was born and uh, the, uh, the co-owner of the company was very excited about the idea about uh, the possibility of, of making something special like that. And he said, let's just do it. Let's, uh, let's do it together. Um, you know, you can uh, tell us what would you like to have in this rehousing and we will do all the actual physical work. And Sounds like a good deal. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, because I'm, I'm useless at, at anything other than <laughs> talking, maybe shooting. <laughs> So I can't even service a lens, you know, I'm really bad on the technical side, but I do know what one would want in a senior lens. And I have this great community of people who can help me uh, because, you know, I, I talk to so many people and I know what people want. And, you know, even things like that preset aperture, you know, it annoys so many people and you can only get rid of it if you do a rehousing. You know, the, uh, all, you know, these Helios lenses, um, some of them, I don't know if you can hear it next to my mic. There's a little wobble at the back there. You know, there might be a wobble. This is not a bad copy, but sometimes, you know, there's a wobble at the front part of the lens. You know, the, the focus ring might not be 100% and there's a wobble on the mount, which is the worst thing because that's where you have like a jump. Oh yeah, mine's, mine's got a little... Yeah, yeah, that's when, you know, if it's really bad, you'll have like a slightly jumping image when you, you know, uh, do the change of rotation on the focus ring. And you know, you just can't get, doesn't matter how good your modification is, you can't get rid of certain things. Because even if you clamp on a PL mount onto the back, the internal part still wobbles. So you know, you know, certain parts will still wobble and you know, it will still be, it still won't be a, an experience that you would want to have on, you know, a highly paid or, you know, just any, any, serious job where people rely on you. So we started with this idea. Uh, thankfully, Iron Glass have a very talented uh, designer who's, who was designing you know, all the previous parts they were making. Uh, and uh, he started, started working on it. And it took us about six to eight months uh, just being quiet about it and working on it, developing it. So it wasn't a quick or easy process because it was the first time doing something like that. And we ended up with, um, with, with this. This is one of the first, it actually has number 20 on it, but it's actually one of the first like prototype rehoused uh, Helios 44 twos. Just seeing that on set, I think inspires a lot more confidence in the client. You know, if you brought a set of those to set, you know, they go, well, that's, that's what I'm paying for, you know, 
it looks the business. Yeah, Whereas yeah, yeah. if you if you brought this and attached it yeah, with even this like that, <laughs> like I can't even. I know. Yeah. I know. I know. You'll I think. have it on this camera as well. It's you know it's funny, especially with no modifications. It's just it's not really. <laughs> <laughs> you can't really bring it on any job. Yeah, people you know, think it's a let toy. alone. Let, let alone anything with with a client on set. Um, so yeah, this when I when I received uh, this, you know, very early one. Uh, even then, I was so excited and gave me so much confidence that I took it on a commercial shoot, uh, kind of for fun, you know, maybe to show my AC. I wasn't maybe planning to use it, but I had um, my Zeiss Yena Zebra set, which has quite similar coating, like early, like single coating rather than, you know, multi coating that has more contrast. So I was using the, I ended up using the Zeiss Yena Zebra for wider stuff. And then when time came to get a bit tighter, I slapped this on, I thought, you know, I'll try it. And it matched really well. And I ended up shooting about 80% of the whole commercial on this one lens. In the final commercial, just had one wider shot at the beginning on the slider and one at the end, like a closing shot. Everything else, including two shots, over the shoulders, close-ups, were all made with that lenses. It, they really can be very versatile, especially on full frame. It all obviously depends which kind of camera you're gonna use it on. If it's gonna be Super 35, it might be a bit tight. But on a, super, uh, on a full frame, you can almost get away with shooting, if you have space, you can almost get away with shooting a lot of stuff on it. So let's let's talk about um, the the look of the lens. I mean, we've talked about what it feels like and how it operates. What what? How would you describe the lens actually looks? I mean, it's famous for its swirly bokeh. You know, I, I really like uh, its look, and one of my favorite things about this lens actually is the way it flares. Um, when I used to use this um, on little shoots, I used to just call it Mr. Flare. So, you know, you tell your AC, let's crack out Mr. Flare, you know, and yeah. it does flare a lot. Um, but personally, I think it's, <laughs> it's done really nicely. There you go. You, I don't you know, know if you can read this. Flare. But it says flare on it. This is my, this is a particular version, you know, I've had 10 or so. It's very wobbly. It, it feels horrible, but it has this, the most amazing flare out of them all. It like flares like crazy, so I call it flare. <laughs> They're not for everything, like I said, but when you want that kind of flare, if, you want, if you're going for something dreamy, uh, the flare is just the most amazing flare that you can think of. Um, it does wash out the image a lot, but um, it's just it's such a beautiful artistic painterly thing to to watch, and it's just it's it's almost uh, like watching some sort of art happening by itself. You know, you're almost like observing it. You know, it just has its own life. It's, it's so interesting and the way, you know, the bokeh um, uh, react to certain textures. But a lot of times you will see the swirly bokeh on, around the edges. And again, it's, it's something that you can't see in real life. So with this lens, by no means you are trying to replicate what you are seeing with your eyes. It's, it's like an artistic tool. Absolutely. You, know, you I mean, use it as a All paintbrush. lenses are tools, right? So as you said, it's, it's not the right lens for every job, you know. If you want something clean, you know, you might go for the Sigmas or Zeiss or something, you know, modern Zeiss, something like that. But if you want something really arty and characterful, you know, I really think there's there's no better lenses than, than these Soviets. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I fully agree. And uh, like, I wouldn't take it on a corporate job. <laughs> yeah. If you know what I mean. But, um, but then for a lot of other things, you know, especially, you know, like, Dreamier, more creative commercials where you can push the look uh, slightly. Yeah, music videos or short films. It's an amazing lens. If there's anyone wanting to buy these lenses, I mean, what, what tips would you give? Because there's, there's a couple of versions, isn't there? Um, Loads, there's there's yeah. the 44.2, which is, that's, that's the original one. If, is that right? So, like I said, it started from the Zeiss and then um, the first Helios version of that lens was the 44. So it didn't have uh, like a Dash 2 or 3 or AM or anything. It was just simply Helios 44. And it was, it had this silver finish. Uh, so it's quite easy to recognize. 
uh, and it shares most of the characteristics of the other lenses. It just was, you know, a very early lens. And in fact, uh, the rumor is that some of these very early lenses had actual Zeiss optical elements inside. You know, just ex literally post-war when, you know, Soviet army got, got hold of all sorts of Zeiss related things. I think they, they have potentially got, uh, got the optical elements that they could use. So maybe, maybe a fairly small batch of these lenses actually had Zeiss glass in them. So from there, they obviously started making their own uh, glass. And, you know, even, even this is probably, you know, Soviet made optic. Uh, but then they went to F44 uh, two, and there are quite a few versions of that, you know, like the, this one is a zebra one. It's quite an early one. Then um, um, this is just all black with uh, white markings. Again, quite an early one. It, it also depends which factory they were made on. on. Uh, that will have a slightly different color scheme. Um, you know, one of the most popular is the, is the yellow and green uh, marked one. So if, if people wanted to play around with it, you can pick them up on eBay for 10 quid, 20 oh, quid. For next to nothing, yeah. yeah. I mean, the average price nowadays might be about $50, but if you know, you, especially in UK and Europe, you can find them in, you know, thrift shops and, you know, like various like car boot garage sales and things like that. You can find them for next to nothing. I've bought so many of them for five pounds. So, so there's a whole range, there's a whole range uh, of use for this lens from very simple, just I'll try it just because it doesn't cost anything. And I think everyone should. When someone asks me, you know, I want to get into vintage lenses, which lens should I try? I always tell them, you know, first you have to try the Helios 44.2. It's, it's cheap, you know, it's, it's, it's probably make you fall in love with the whole idea. You know, it's, you know, I know people will get hooked and it won't cost them much. So there, there are a lot of people who are unsure if it's for them or not. And, you know, this lens allows them to, to get into this world and see if they like it. And then if you, they feel like it, if they want to take it to the next stage, they can add modifications to it themselves. You know, I, I used to use a, a screen PL adapter, you know, cheaper gears to, to make it more usable. You know, if you want to go one step up, you can, you know, ask a company to do it or then at the highest level, if you really love that lens, like I do, then you can, you know, get um, like rehouse. So moral of the story, if you don't already have one of these, get hold of one ASAP. It's, it's gotta be the, the one lens everyone has to try. Yeah, you have to get it either way. Yeah, yeah, there's no excuse. There's literally no excuse. There's so many variations and uh, you just can't go wrong. You know, you, you, the most important thing is not to overthink it. Uh, you know, like you need to find a perfect one or you need the perfect version of it. Because sometimes people, they get overwhelmed by all the choice. They, you know, you just just search for one, pick one up, uh, cheap, don't, don't overpay for one. If you don't know what it is, just get it and uh, I promise you will fall in love with it. I haven't met a single person who has tried this lens and wasn't absolutely in love with it. <laughs>